So we'll get we'll go ahead and get started and apologize again for the technical issues with the the links, but uh, glad to see that um, so many people have come in to our New Year's luncheon. Of course, this year we're having to do it virtual, so we're not actually having a luncheon like we normally do. Uh, but I just wanted to say welcome to everybody. Um, I, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Linda Van Eldick. I'm the director of Sanders Brown Center on Aging and the Alzheimer's Disease Center. And I just really want to reiterate our welcome and also our profound gratitude for you as our volunteers. I mean, you are what helps us to do the work that we do. We couldn't without you and we're so grateful for it. And so today we're celebrating you. We're celebrating your contributions to the center and making us great. And I also wanted to just let you know that um, Dr. Jaika will be giving kind of a summary and updates on where the field is in terms of Alzheimer's clinical studies, what's going on in terms of our race for the cure. There's lots of exciting things happening in the field, but I won't steal his thunder. I just wanna tell you about some exciting things that are happening in Sanders Brown as a whole. Uh, we have, we're doing some really exciting things in the center. We've gotten a lot of support from University of Kentucky, from UK Healthcare, from the College of Medicine. And we have recruited two new faculty recently who are going to be doing some wonderful research. We have also gotten um, commitments from the university to expand our research space here on campus. So several faculty will be moving over to the Todd building, which is across the street from the Sanders Brown Center on Aging building. So very close by. And that will also give us um, expansion space for recruiting new faculty in the future. So we're in a growth phase. It's very exciting. There's a lot of research money at NIH right now for Alzheimer's disease because um, people are realizing how important it is to do research in order to be able to find effective interventions and medications. Uh, we also have very exciting news about the clinic, which will be of interest to everyone. We actually are going to, through the support of Sanders Brown, UK, UK Healthcare, and the College of Medicine, we are going to be um, moving the clinic into brand new space. It's going to give more than double the space that we have now, and it'll be state of the art. We'll have wonderful rooms, we'll have wonderful facilities, we'll have nice reception area and waiting areas for the families when you come to have your annual visit. It's going to be just wonderful. And um, I have a rendering of it when, when we get the slides going later. You, you can see what the building is going to look like. And um, the Philanthropy Council is very involved in helping us to continue to raise funds for the clinic. And Catherine Campbell will talk to you in a bit about that and kind of what we're doing to really make this a, a true vision. Uh, the, the tentative arrangement is that around November, we hope we'll be able to have it all finished and ready to move in. So just very exciting news happening in the center and in the clinic. And it's really, it's, it's really wonderful. We, we are on a true trajectory of um, continued excellence and you guys are helping to make us really great. So thank you again. And let's see if everybody's in now. Is, is Dr. J in, in the Zoom? If not, I'll ask Pete to give some words. Okay, my pleasure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Van Eldick, and again, sorry for the technical snafus and appreciate your patience. Um, my name is Pete Nelson. I am a neuropathologist, which means I do the brain autopsies. I've been here with my family for about 16 years, and we have loved it so much being here in Lexington. The two things that I want to convey are, are pretty, pretty punchy, pretty simple. Number one, that we're all a part of something special. Um, that... And so I'm conveying this to you as research volunteers, 
that this is a very special time and place to be a part of. And the second is to reiterate what Dr. Van Eldick said about the gratitude that's felt about the, uh, from the, the, the researchers and being a part of a team together with the research volunteers, because we're working together as partners. So those are two things that I just want to convey uh, straight up. One of the things that I wanted to concentrate on in this very, very brief uh, chat is just to convey something that for some reason, Dr. Jaika is, um, he's not a very shy guy, but this is one thing that he doesn't beat his chest on as much as he should. And that is to convey to you about clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease. Clinical trials are what are gonna make Alzheimer's go away. It's, it's gonna make it so that it's prevented in the future. In order to do a clinical trial, and this is something that people should know, is that a consortia is required of places all around the country that need to recruit research volunteers because you need for any clinical trial to have it be multi-centered. And so places like Stanford and Harvard and all that great places and us, we get together and we decide who has the research volunteers. And the last time I checked, the place with the most research volunteers in dementia clinical trials in the country was the University of Kentucky number one in the country. Now we are proud about our bourbon, our basketball, our this and that, maybe not so much basketball this year, but every year we're great at Alzheimer's disease and dementia clinical trials. That's something that we should all feel very proud of. But number one, and it gets to both of those points that I'm talking about, that both the specialness of this place and the gratitude that we feel working together. And it's not that you're helping us or we're helping you, we're all helping each other to excel. We're working together as a team. And so it's, it's something very special to me. It's, a, it's kind of a spiritual thing to consider that this is the place where most people are going to get treated first for these dementia disorders right here at the University of Kentucky. That's a special thing to be involved in. And you need to know that, uh, that that's something that we as researchers take very seriously. Another role that I inhabit though is I'm not interacting directly with everybody all the time, I'm, I perform autopsies, the brain autopsies, and I help to bank the biosamples that are gathered at the University of Kentucky Alzheimer's Disease Center. Then researchers around the whole campus, dozens of them, and then researchers around the world, hundreds of them request biosamples that we send out. So last year we sent out about 5,000 biosamples around the world, more than 10 every single day, Christmas, New Year, Thanksgiving, to move this field forward. And so what I want to convey to you is that that's special. That's not usual. Places, other places like Harvard and Stanford, they don't do it as good as we do it. And secondly, that it's done in a spirit of deep respect because we're working together with you, the research volunteers, to accomplish something that's really important for us as researchers. And I know for you as, as volunteers, to move the field forward and get to a world where dementia is a thing of the past. So I just wanted to convey those points. We're really, really grateful. We're really, really psyched about this being such a special place. I vo voted with my feet, as do many of you, to be involved in this place. Um, we moved our family from Philadelphia and I have never looked back. This is just such a great place to do research. And I wanted to just convey that enthusiasm to you all um, as partners in this process of doing research. And with that, um, I, I hope that is Dr. Jaika online? It doesn't look like it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what the problem is. He should be able to use the same link that you and I are using. He can literally just, do you want me to just forward that to him, Sally? I think each link is unique to the person. It just, for some reason doesn't like Dr. Jaika. I like Dr. Jaika. <laughs> well, we can always have Catherine go ahead and, and talk. Do you, do you have to have slides, Catherine, or can you talk? Um, I do have slides, but it's okay. We can do without them. Um, hopefully in a little bit, we'll get to show you all the new rendering um, of the new clinic space. Um, like Dr. Van Eldick said, I'm Catherine Campbell, Director of Philanthropy for Sanders Brown Center on Aging. And we were so excited to tell you all today about this new memory clinic. 
In just 40 years, Sanders Brown has built an international reputation for best in class research into a disease that kills more people every year than breast and prostate cancer combined. Our memory clinic is the place where our research will intersect with patient care and its current location is cramped and out of date. I'm sure many of you all are very familiar with our current clinic that's located off South Broadway. But we have this amazing opportunity to, bu to build a larger, better space that will connect our clients and their families to a wide range of on-site services that'll help keep them on the path of healthy aging. It'll be a one-stop shop for memory care and support. It'll be almost three times larger with more space for consultations, testing, and learning. The world looks to us, Sanders Brown, right here in Lexington, Kentucky, for the answers to the mysteries of dementia. And it's time that our home for patient care reflect that reputation. But our vision depends on you and the support of our community. With your help, we'll be ready to meet the needs of our aging community for generations to come. And now I just wanna tell you a little bit about what the new clinic will offer. At almost 15,000 square feet, the new clinic will have the technology and space to accommodate expanded research, education, and patient care, almost tripling our capacity to serve patients and research volunteers. The space will also be able to accommodate multiple disciplines in support of healthy aging, like medication management, lifestyle adaptations, addressing sleep disturbances, reducing fall risk, and even improving financial management. We'll also have many collated services, including cognitive testing, gait analysis, retinal analysis, dedicated space for social work consultations, patient education rooms, and separate general and extended waiting areas. Also a new telemedicine space, which is so important during this time of COVID, as well as the new clinic will offer proximity to other UK healthcare clinics and very important, better parking and wayfinding, which we know is so important. As some of you may or may not realize, philanthropy helped build the first facilities for, the, for Sanders Brown more than 40 years ago. And today, philanthropy is still um, essential to support our mission to find a cure for this disease. But like I said earlier, we can do this, but not without the help and support of our community. UK Healthcare has released a $5 million match opportunity, meaning any funds that we raised will be doubled. Any gift will have double the impact. Every gift makes a difference and every gift counts. We have an immediate goal of raising $1.5 million to offset the cost of building a new clinic. To date, we have raised almost $500,000 to make this dream a reality. If you're interested in learning more, I would be thrilled to share more information in ways that you can support this new clinic. And with that, hopefully we can get the PowerPoint up with my information on it. But if you have access to a computer, you can always Google Sanders Brown Center on Aging. We do have an image of the new clinic on the homepage and my information is also on the website. So this is such an exciting time and it has been something that I've heard about since I've been here and I know it's been talked about for years. So we are just so excited. Thank you all. all right, thank you, Catherine and Pete. So um, apparently Dr. Jika's computer decided it needed to reboot. And so he's trying to join us um, as, as quickly as he can. Um, I don't know, Sally or Adrian, whether it would be worth showing the rendering of the of the clinic we could at least put that slide up they might be busy trying to help dr jica get in 
Well, all right, here we go. Yeah, so this is this is what the new clinic is going to look like. Um, it's it's going to be sleek. It's going to be modern. It's going to be new, and it's going to look beautiful. And it's going to be so spacious that you guys just won't believe the difference. I mean, it finally will be a facility that is worthy of the great stuff we do together. So um, I'm hoping that everything goes well with the construction. It's just wonderful that, that this is actually coming to fruition because like Catherine said, this has been a long time coming. I, I started talking about this when I came to Sanders Brown 10 years ago trying to figure out how can we get a clinic facility that is actually functional and working well. And, and that just is another testament, a testament to how amazing we Dr. are. Vinelli, a yes. couple of people are, are asking about where it's going to be. Would you be able to share that? Well, we're, we're, we're sort of not allowed to say just yet. Um, we can show you what it looks like, but, but we have to be a little bit cautious in terms of when we release the information about where it is. Um, it, it, it will come out very soon, believe me. It's, and it's, it's in Lexington, it's not that far away. I'm sorry. If we I, told you, we'd have to kill ourselves, <laughs> so we can't do that, but. <laughs> All right, that looks so good. Not too far from a home. Depot. How about the slide? Yeah, with Catherine's information on it. Yes, that slide. So there's Catherine's email and phone number uh, and all the other information. And she would love to talk to anybody that wants to get involved with us. Yeah, so that's a good idea. So um, why don't I introduce the, um, so we hired two new faculty recently. You might be interested in that. So one faculty is Mark Ebert. He comes to us from Mayo Clinic Jacksonville, and he is actually in the Zoom chat today. So he's, uh, he's, going to be doing some wonderful stuff. He, he, he looks at genetic variations in, um, in disease progression and how different forms of your genetics affects your susceptibility to disease. He works with lots of really big data. So it was great that we could get him here and we're working with the Institute for Biomedical Informatics to um, He's, he'll also have an appointment there, which is one of the uh, premier College of Medicine uh, informatics uh, systems at UK to be able to store and handle and analyze really large amounts of data. So we're excited for Mark to join us and he will actually, his lab will be over in the Todd building in the new nice facility that um, hopefully they'll be moving over there in about a month or so. We're working hard to get that move to happen. Uh, the second faculty member is Josh Morganti. He actually was a research track faculty member and now is his own independent faculty member. And he studies inflammation in the brain and how as we age, various inflammatory mechanisms uh, start becoming dysfunctional and how that affects uh, your susceptibility to other diseases such as a traumatic brain injury or other kinds of insults. And his lab will also be over in the new Todd, in the fifth floor of the Todd building. So that's very exciting. We also hope in the future to be able to get permission to uh, be able to recruit more faculty, especially we'd love to get another neurologist to um, help out Dr. Jaika in all of the work that he does. Uh, we'd love to get a neuroimager to be able to look at much of many of the uh, the imaging techniques that are coming out and being very exciting. You'll hear about some of those imaging um, approaches from Dr. Jaika. 
So it's a time of growth for us. We were developing a whole new strategic plan, kind of a two year, five year, 10 year plan so that we can kind of figure out where, where we're going as a group and how are we gonna best get there. So it's very exciting times. Um, 2021 is going to be a much better year than 2020. <laughs> so we're excited to move forward. Uh, thanks, Dr. Benelli. One, one thing I was thinking about when, while she was talking is how um, science is a little bit like uh, analogous perhaps to NCAA basketball or other things where in order to get the, to be the best, you have to recruit the best. And in order to recruit the best, you can't only have a a local uh, uh, sort of scope. And so the people that she just talked about were Dr. Marganti, who came from San Francisco in a great lab in Florida. Um, Dr. Ebert, he came from an outstanding place at Mayo Clinic. Um, Dr. Van Eldick herself came from uh, Northwestern in Chicago. I came from Philly. Uh, Dr. Jica came from Mayo. The people that we recruit in order to be the very best in the world you have to have a very broad scope and you have to get a team together of the very best in the world. And so in order to do that, it's, it's challenging and you have to have sort of like college basketball, you have to have a brand, you have to have a sort of a critical mass of outstanding people to build on. And so I think that something that people around here in Lexington should know about is that there just is an ex excessively great brand for dementia and Alzheimer's research here at the University of Kentucky. People around the world know about it. Um, and so it's, it's less challenging to recruit the best of the best to a great place that people already know about. And so that's just something I just, I'm, I'm not trying to, to brag on it. It's something that brought me here um, more than I am bragging on it. And so I'm just wanted, but I think it's important for people that are participating, especially as research volunteers, to know that the place that that you're involved with has special qualities, um, and that the recruits that we have, um, and that are um, are um, participating in the research here, are truly the best in the world. Thank you. So this is just sort of a broad perspective on the Sanders Brown Center on Aging Research Volunteers and the, the approach that's been used um, uh, historically. And I can give a little perspective on that because it's and, actually what brought me here. Oh, Dr. Jica? And Dr. Nelson, I finally made it on as Catherine Campbell, but I, uh, but I eventually made it on. Uh, so okay. Okay. If, you guys could, if you guys could stop the screen share, I'll start mine. My ap my apologies to everyone. Uh, the host needs to enable screen sharing. All right. Fantastic. Uh, uh, again, my apologies to everybody in the group and uh, to my other panelists. I tried about a hundred different links to get on board here and uh, eventually made it. That uh, is true. Sanders Brown Science functioning a little slower than normal, but nonetheless, I, I, uh, uh, we'll walk through. I know that many of you, you know, are interested in hearing where we've been in the last year, where we're going. Uh, I do. I didn't have an opportunity to say it uh, to all of you, and I know that it's been said, but uh, uh, really, thank you all so uh, very much for everything that you have done, because we can't do anything without you, and uh, we are working forward to the day when we are able to cure Alzheimer's and related dementias. So uh, I'll jump past uh, everything that folks have already put together. And I did wanna just briefly uh, comment on, 
you know, COVID-19 has really been a wrench in the works over the last year. We have actually published four papers uh, uh, since COVID began, specifically on the impact that COVID has on research itself. And I serve on several national research panels that are addressing these issues. You know, we've really looked at what's been done around the globe and have tried to incorporate the very best into everything that we do to keep you all safe and enable you to continue to help with the research uh, uh, as you feel comfortable. So, you know, uh, uh, those of you that have been into the center recently may recognize in this upper left-hand corner uh, our, co our own personal Sanders Brown drive-through COVID swabbing station uh, with Barbara coming at you with all of her gear on. And uh, that's me in my little red car getting swabbed myself uh, 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 before uh, being allowed into the building, of course check-ins where we ask you many questions to make sure you're not symptomatic, uh, where we take your temperature. Uh, there is plenty of uh, PPE, a term that none of us knew probably a year ago, but we're becoming quite familiar with masks, gloves, antiseptics, hand cleaners. Of course, the rooms are all sanitized between every visit and uh, uh, we have plexiglass screens as well to aid in social distancing even when you're uh, being tested. Uh, we really uh, uh, have, have calculated these precautions and as I like to say, you know, in, in a rough way, the statisticians don't like my calculations, but we know that the risk of dying from a lightning strike is one in 700,000. Uh, the risk of dying from COVID from a research visit in our clinic is one in almost 38 million. Uh, uh, you, you'd do better to uh, potentially win the lotto. So, uh, of course, we understand for many of you that may not feel safe uh, until we're all vaccinated and this goes away. We certainly understand and appreciate that. Uh, but I do want to uh, just uh, uh, reinforce uh, that the, the, the staff has just worked so hard, so diligently to make sure that you can safely continue to contribute uh, uh, as you feel comfortable. So with that, let's move on to our research update because, you know, really uh, we're at, at a tremendous time uh, in the field. Uh, we know, and we presented on this before, that the path to Alzheimer's is a really, really long one. You know, it may begin 20 years prior to the development of a memory problem with a slow buildup of amyloid plaques that injure nerve cells and begin to create tangles. And <clears throat> as more and more cells die, the brain starts to malfunction we could start to see shrinkage on some of the brain scans that many of you undergo. And only when that shrinkage and brain malfunction gets bad enough, do we start to see memory problems. And if they persist, we know that one can develop functional decline. That's the stage that we classically have called Alzheimer's. But again, we understand that this process occurs over decades. So we try to update you a little bit on ongoing and recently completed studies over the last year. And we'll, we'll kind of start with this diagram as well. And this is a slide that I got from Risa Sperling. She is the national principal investigator for the A4 study and for the AHEAD or what we call the A3 and 4-5 trials. So uh, the continuum of Alzheimer's disease, we've just discussed briefly. We know that normal aging, there can be some mild changes in memory and thinking. But in Alzheimer's, the, the curves start to diverge and we get this dotted line, uh, uh, preclinical Alzheimer's disease leading to mild cognitive impairment and eventually dementia. And the 
neuropathology, and Dr. Nelson is our resident uh, uh, neuropathologist guru, really, uh, uh, pro probably the most visible uh, and, uh, and truly uh, one of the greatest neuropathologists uh, uh, that's ever lived, uh, will talk to you about this. You know, we, we see here some tangles in the brain, those are nerve cells, and then we see these what we call neuritic plaques. This is Alzheimer's disease, and it used to be that only when one passed away could we identify this, but now we've developed new techniques that may be spinal fluid. We'll talk a little bit about the advances in blood biomarkers soon, uh, but we also know that we have new PET imaging, and many of you may have undergone PET imaging that is able to show us the amyloid plaques up above as one moves from normal and no red in the brain to an Alzheimer's case with lots of, of signal showing up. And the same thing more recently for tau. Uh, now, the A-beta PET scans are FDA approved. The tau scans are up for approval currently, but, uh, uh, but not uh, approved. They show us the tangles. So now we can see the plaques and tangles in living individuals. And we do know in some that are normal in these two center panels, there can be plaques and tangles before memory problems actually even begin. And we know that those are related. So we know that the more amyloid you build up in your brain, the more likely you are to start developing tangles. And we kind of see that trajectory here increasing in both of our upper figures, telling us that uh, the amyloid is rapidly followed by these tangles over time. This has uh, been called uh, uh, by Risa the catastrophe uh, uh, because it's these tau and neurofibrillary tangles that are most closely related to future memory loss. So there are many challenges in our studies. We know, you know, 13 phase three trial failures over the last two decades uh, in Alzheimer's disease. And, uh, you know, we do have one medicine that's being considered by the FDA currently. Uh, my prediction is that the FDA is not going to approve this. We'll see. I, uh, I think there are some safety issues with this medication. Uh, it's one that we chose not to work with here at the center, uh, largely because of those safety issues. But we do know that some of our medicines do need to actually be used much earlier than memory problems appear. And many of you may be in those sorts of studies. We also know that even if we can't as of yet completely cure the disease, if we could slow it by just five years, we would save hundreds of billions of dollars here in the United States. So that's a, a just amazing. So when we look at drug trials, we look at three different kind of phases. We look at primary prevention way back before anybody even gets the disease. That might be like the COVID vaccine that many people are getting. You haven't yet had COVID, let's give you the vaccine beforehand so you never develop it. And we are working uh, in this area. Secondary prevention, all right, you've caught the COVID, but we don't want you to get sick and die from it. So we're going to give you a little remdesivir. And so many of you receiving infusions at the center, very, very similar and draw a parallel to what's on the news with COVID. These are antibodies given to you to allow you to fight off Alzheimer's disease. And then in the later stages of disease, when we actually have memory problems, we consider that tertiary prevention and or treatment, trying to slow or stop the process to keep people doing well anyway. So uh, we began this journey many, many years ago and uh, our long longest running study currently with a drug in it. Of course, our longitudinal research program has been running since uh, the mid 1980s, but uh, uh, the longest running clinical trial with the drug is actually 
the A4 study. And I know that some of you that are online here with us today are part of this study and have been ongoing for years. Sometimes it feels like it may never end. Uh, but in the meanwhile, let me say the folks here at UK uh, in this study are doing fantastic. Uh, the, the vast majority, of course, there was a period of time where some were getting placebo and some were getting medicine, uh, uh, the real medicine. Uh, now this has evolved to what we call an open label extension. And I believe that virtually everyone in the A4 study now uh, that continues to come in is receiving the real medicine. And that's just wonderful. We also know that midway in this study, the safety data looks so good that the FDA encouraged us to, you know, let's raise that dose a little bit. Everybody's doing good and Alzheimer's is a tough, tough enemy. So, you know, let's make sure we're using enough to really, to really uh, impact the disease. So, uh, those of you uh, that have been in this may know, you know, it took over 15,000 people across the United States to be contacted to express an interest of those 15,000. Many may, were not eligible. Almost 7,000 were brought into not just our clinic at UK, but clinics across the nation uh, to eventually do an amyloid PET scan on about 4,500. And of those, about a third had elevated amyloid at the level we'd expect to see in somebody with full-blown Alzheimer's and memory problems. And two-thirds did not have elevated amyloid. And uh, that eventually got us into uh, the study to almost 1,200 people on this medication. So uh, we've been able to look and really just in the last year, the first publications have come out on A4. I really shouldn't say the first because we published the first uh, uh, probably six years ago when we were in a recruitment phase for this study. We published on a new way to bring people together uh, and uh, uh, discuss the study to enhance understanding and to uh, help people get their questions answered so that they could make the right decision for themselves. But now we're looking at that baseline data and this is, you know, the SP pack is the computerized testing that we're using in this study. And we can see while everybody here is in this study is normal in terms of their memory and thinking, we can see that those that had amyloid in their brain were slightly lower in general than those without amyloid. So we know even though the amyloid is in the brain and we think it's not causing any symptoms, it is already beginning to impact brain function very, very, very subtly. This is a very important finding. We, we also know that some of the uh, measures that we use in the study are predictive of whether or not one would have amyloid in their brain. So uh, uh, memory decline. So people who say my memory is going down the tubes are actually more likely to have amyloid in their brain. Uh, uh, people frequently misplacing objects or getting disoriented with travel may be at higher risk to have amyloid in their brain that could be contributing uh, to this. Uh, and so very, very important that we take your memory and thinking concerns very, very seriously. Uh, of course, these are not absolutes. We have many people that feel that their memory is declining that have absolutely no amyloid in their brain and are not going on to develop any worsening disease. But interesting to look at this at the beginning. And we also know from the A4 study, again, that the more amyloid you have in your brain, the more likely you are to begin to develop neurofibrillary tangles. And so these beautiful colored pictures show us in the very earliest stages before one even develops a memory problem, shows us 
where the tangles are, where they're starting to grow and build. And this really uh, uh, supports the work done by neuropathologists like Dr. Nelson over the years. So in addition to the A4 study medication, which is still moving forward. We have every indication right now, and, and we believe still that uh, the A4 drug may ha uh, significantly reduce risk for progression. That's wonderful. But we've been working also with another agent, the Bantu 401 antibody. Again, another medicine designed to target the plaques in the brains of folks with Alzheimer's disease. We can see uh, in this, the colorful panels to the right and the top panel, somebody whose brain is full of amyloid when they came in. This is somebody who had early memory problems, early Alzheimer's. And after one year, the, the red got even worse. This is what happens in Alzheimer's disease. But for those receiving this medication, we, in the lower colorful panel, we were able to see somebody who came in with a brain full of amyloid plaques, and we were able to remove those plaques. And believe it or not, uh, uh, some of you uh, out there here in Lexington that have been in this study, we know that this has happened to you. We know that your plaques have been removed, and that is just wonderful. So everybody who helped us with the early phase two study uh, had the opportunity to now I'll be receiving this medication, not a placebo, but everyone to be receiving the real medication now while these studies move forward. And over the past year, the final phase three has been enrolling and uh, the enrollment uh, just stopped. There are people here at UK still in screening. We hope to get you on this medicine uh, if we make it through those hurdles. But many of you with mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease here at UK are receiving this medicine. Uh, and I have high hopes that the study results are going to be positive. So now, we also know, as we were talking about, you know, that uh, when we look at the buildup of amyloid over time, this is age dependent. And uh, at the bottom here, we see folks with very low levels of amyloid, and they may not change. The folks up top with higher levels of amyloid are on an increasing, you know, if you have amyloid, it's likely to be getting worse over time. And uh, what we noticed in several studies, this comes from the Harvard Aging Brain Study, was that people with even very low levels are still on an upward trajectory. And that has really pushed us to move back even further, to be thinking, you know, let's not wait until the brain is full of amyloid plaques. Let's try to identify people with the very earliest changes of amyloid plaques. And <clears throat> again, this is a complicated slide, but it tells us that the amyloid level initially then is prone to change, and that leads to tau accumulation, which eventually impacts memory and thinking. And uh, we know that this is how the disease works, and so two new studies have begun, the A3 and the A4-5 study, trying to move even earlier then the A4 study in terms of treating people, we call these uh, studies the AHEAD study. And uh, it's really two studies. Uh, we estimate that about two out of every three persons above the age of 65 have some level of amyloid, although it may be very, very low, that may benefit from treatment with these medicines. And we're using the same, the band 2401 is being used in a head 
just like it's being used in clarity for those with memory problems. So this is a major national initiative, uh, uh, really. Uh, two studies in one, that means more people are gonna get the real medicine as opposed to placebo. Uh, looking at folks age 55 to 80, uh, and uh, uh, that's wonderful, as you can tell, moving back earlier and earlier and uh, uh, really uh, using the latest amyloid PET and tau PET scans to understand whether or not the medicine is actually stopping and or reversing the disease state. So this enrollment is open currently and any of you out there that uh, are interested or feel that you're at risk for Alzheimer's and would like to receive this medication, please contact us. Uh, uh, like A4, we will be filling this up and uh, trying our best to clean Alzheimer's plaques and tangles out of as many brains as we can. Again, we know that once the tangles start, they begin to take on a life of their own. They may be prompted by the amyloid in the brain, but they do indeed take on a life of their own. And so we have been working to try to target the tangles as well. And so we look up in this top panel, these are uh, 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 the brains of mice that have neurofibrillary tangles. And when we treat them with these uh, medicines, these antibodies, we can completely clean the Alzheimer's out of the brain. That is wonderful. So we've been enrolling and many of you may be in the AWARE study. We've been enrolling and treating people in that study for several years now. Uh, almost everybody has rolled again into the open label extension. No more placebo. Everybody gets the real medicine. We expect those study results in about one year, about the same time frame that we expect the earliest A4 results to start coming out. So next year is going to be a very, very exciting time for us uh, to actually see these studies. So uh, based on our best data to date, and I wish I had some results here, uh, but we know that the sponsor, AbbVie, is moving forward with that open label extension. Again, we should get results in about one one year and there are many other pharmaceutical companies that have brought together their anti-tau drugs and uh, we're just starting to work with ucb uh, on what they call the tau gather trial one wonders how many puns we can have about tau uh, as we begin to really explore whether or not we can get an impact from these anti-tangle medicines. And uh, eventually, it may be that we find that we need both. Maybe we need to get rid of the plaques and the tangles. Uh, uh, we'll see. The field is working towards that. But as of yet, we're holding our breath. Uh, I can't wait for the results. One of the other studies we've been working on over the last year, and this is really hot off the presses, this is about a week or so old, and uh, uh, it is a study that we call T2 Protect. Biohaven is the sponsor, and it is a medicine designed to stop nerve cells from dying. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the results as we, we're looking at them seem to suggest that the medicine did not work. Uh, there wasn't a statistical slowing of dementia. Uh, there was no statistical slowing of, uh, uh, of uh, the disease. Uh, it continued to progress. Uh, for those with much milder Alzheimer's disease that were in the study, there were trends suggesting, well, if we use the medicine early enough, it might work. Uh, Non-statistical, again, slowing of brain atrophy and mild AD. Uh, I, I suspect that the T2 study may be halted in the future and that we may go back as we analyze the data more to try to again figure out with that personalized medicine strategy, 
can we find the right people at the right stage of disease where the medicine may make an impact. So while disappointing, uh, every clinical trial moves us closer and teaches us something that we build on again and again. Many of you uh, uh, were in the alpha study or even in our original study, uh, working with Alltech on AT001. Our original phase one study showed that uh, the uh, supplement was incredibly safe, uh, that it reduced inflammation in the body and reduced Alzheimer proteins in the brain. And we were quite happy about that. The alpha study was a phase two with a larger group. And again, in the spinal fluid, we saw a significant preservation a uh, reduction of age and Alzheimer's related amyloid uh, uh, buildup. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're currently going through this data uh, to see what else it can show us. I wish I had more for you today, uh, but this looks very promising. Uh, and uh, we hope to have that data analyzed and uh, potentially move on to a large scale multi-center study across the nation and potentially even the globe. Many of you are in the increased study. Uh, we know uh, uh, that many of the medicines that our doctors prescribe us could potentially be harmful for our brains. And we see this in the news all the time, including even common over-the-counter medications. So the INCREASE study was really designed for us to take a look at whether or not we can get people off of inappropriate medicines and whether or not that is gonna help their brain uh, resist Alzheimer type changes, whether it's gonna help improve their memory and thinking to get them off of these agents. And the pilot study that led to increase certainly demonstrated that that was uh, what we were accomplishing. Now the increase study is coming to an end uh, in the next two months. Uh, I don't yet have any of the final outcome data on that study, but the study itself has taught us a lot. The original concept here was that we all have some degree of what we call cognitive reserve, the ability to withstand plaques and tangles without developing a memory problem. And that if we optimized your medication, we could strengthen your cognitive reserve, strengthen your ability to resist Alzheimer type changes. And as the study moves forward, we've learned more and more about this. And it's also become readily apparent that walking in balance appears to have a reserve to it as well and that uh, uh, managing your finances being able to maintain your independence with driving and transportation that adjusting your medicines can help keep you functional in all three of these areas. And so we've submitted another large NIH grant, several million dollars. This is under review currently, uh, where we are going to try to see if we can keep you all walking and running without falling, keep you managing your finances, keep you driving longer than you would have if we had allowed you to continue to decline. We're going to incorporate not only uh, um, uh, 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 the medication optimization, but also physical and occupational therapy strategies to keep you functional. This is what we call our frame AD study. Uh, and we have high hopes that this will move forward. So. Again, uh, just some data that shows us that as you build up amyloid in your brain, your walking actually gets slower. That's on the uh, left and on the right, 
how we might be able to intervene. We're using a very unique measure. It's something called Drums Alive. Uh, it uh, coordinates kind of a, uh, you can think of yourself as a drummer in a marching band. And uh, the rhythm and the exercise is intertwined with brain strengthening memory type games. And uh, really it's a very, very fun way to uh, preserve your function. And this just shows that if you're in the Drums and Live program, even after just a few short months, your ability to operate the brakes in your car and avoid a collision improves dramatically. Statistically significant avoidance of accidents because you'll hit those brakes sooner. That's wonderful. That uh, may keep us all uh, doing well. And of course, the EXERT study. We have many of you exercising. I know many have been on a hiatus uh, uh, from the YMCA with the coronavirus and have been asked to walk and exercise on your own. Hopefully with vaccinations, you'll be able to get back into the Y safely in the future. Uh, we don't yet have these results, but we suspect in a year or so, uh, we're gonna start seeing those uh, results. This is from another study that's come out this year, basically showing us that uh, people that exercise improve their memory and thinking, shifting from uh, red instead of a decline in red, a decline in memory, shifting to maintaining your abilities and even improving in blue. And uh, that's compared here to social activity. Uh, which hopefully we'll be able to get back to as well uh, if we can get this coronavirus under control. Well, one of the biggest breakthroughs of the year uh, that uh, we have really been instrumental in uh, working uh, not only with you all as we collect your blood, but with Donna Wilcock, uh, who runs the biomarker core at the Alzheimer's Disease Center has been to develop these new blood tests so that maybe we, we won't need expensive PET scans in the future. Maybe we won't need you to agree to donate your spinal fluid. Maybe we can get all this information from a simple blood test. And the data looks great. The first tests are beginning to come out now that are commercially available and they show that we can measure some of the tau that leads to neurofibrillary tangles in the blood very very reliably and if that's elevated uh it is an indicator that you have alzheimer's disease but not several of the other forms of degenerative dementia. So uh, a very, very good test that we may be able to use to screen the population, not just in the United States, but around the globe for early Alzheimer changes that then can identify folks to get in line for some of these experimental medicines that you all are helping us move forward. We have several other studies coming online. I promise every year we will not stop until we cure Alzheimer's and we will not even stop when we cure Alzheimer's because we're gonna work on Lewy body disease and frontotemporal dementia and late and, and vascular dementia. But a few of these are, are worthwhile to talk about. Uh, Invoke is a study that should be starting in the next few weeks. This again is an uh, antibody that is infused uh, in the arm and uh, it uh, actually activates the microglia in the brain and uh, uh, the microglia are kind of, you know, like Pac-Man, they're the cells in the brain that eat debris. And so those microglia are trying to get rid of the plaques and tangles. They're trying to eat all that garbage right out of your brain. And uh, uh, we need to turn up those microglia so that they can help with that process. And that's exactly 
what this new medication does. This is a new novel approach to the treatment of Alzheimer's uh, that uh, really, really we are excited about. Uh, uh, a lot of the work from Linda Van Eldick's lab has really paved the way uh, in discovery uh, in regards to the role that these microglia play in brain health and disease. And uh, for the first time, we're really seeing uh, a number of medicines come out that are starting to target that inflammation, these microglia, to gobble up that Alzheimer's right out of your brain, leaving the brain healthy and clean of disease. We'll see how this pans out. The medicine really, again, designed to uh, influence, we could see in the right, you know, these antibodies that uh, then bind to the microglia and turn them on to remove tau and tangles and remove amyloid plaques, but also to provide nourishing factors and help maintain synapses and connections between uh, uh, nerve cells. And uh, at least uh, in cell culture and in the animals <coughs> that have been studied, we can see significant changes in the microglia really uh, 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 keeping the microglia eating what they're not supposed to eat and keeping them from injuring other nerve cells or cells in the brain that they should not be injuring. So very, very important. Uh, of course, the AHEAD study, again, I want you all to keep uh, on the top of your list. Uh, uh, this, uh, we're gonna need hundreds of people here uh, in, in Kentucky uh, to come in to help us with this study, uh, moving even further back earlier in the disease. Let's stop Alzheimer's before it can take root even as a seedling. Uh, uh, other studies we're working on now, we have one that's starting up called Harmony at Home. This is being run by Elizabeth Rodis, uh, one of my uh, postdocs. Uh, and really she's an occupational therapist who's working on trying to change the home, trying to change the sensory environment for folks with memory and thinking problems to help alleviate some of the behaviors and agitation that we can see in folks with mild cognitive impairment and early Alzheimer's disease. And so uh, Elizabeth sending people, you know, all sorts of, you know, fancy things for their home, lavender oil, oils and uh, uh, soothing uh, CD-ROMs for the brain and a lot of science behind this. Uh, many of our medicines to treat behaviors can be very harmful, have a lot of side effects. If we can impact these behaviors with such a safe and pleasant approach to adjusting sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and touch, uh, that would be a wonderful move forward in terms of what we call non-pharmacologic interventions, meaning ways like exercise for Alzheimer's, ways that we're not using a drug, but still can impact and change the disease. And of course, you know, there are many other studies and I can't talk about all of them today. We've talked a little bit about the INVOKE study, the Frame AD study that we hope to get funded and bring on board, the PINO study for Lewy body disease, the Tau Gather study to try to remove tangles, but also our studies on uh, SMART HS on late uh, hippocampal sclerosis of aging, the most common Alzheimer's mimic that's been popularized by Dr. Nelson, who's really done the groundbreaking work uh, 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 in this area. Mark VCID, working on that vascular disease in your brain if you have vascular cognitive impairment and or vascular dementia. A new initiative to enable us to uh, get brain scans on everyone 
that comes into our center if they are willing to teach us more. Uh, uh, we're looking at a, a protein uh, that uh, kind of interacts with amyloid in the brain and in the peripheral nervous system that may be related to diabetes and or early pre-diabetic changes that may contribute to Alzheimer's disease. Some of you we may ask in the future to have a small piece of your skin uh, donated and biopsied, a really tiny piece, it's not a big one, and you, you grow it back in just a few days. Uh, of course, retinal imaging, brainwave testing, uh, and those blood biomarkers that we talked about, uh, what an exciting time. So uh, we're seeing real progress. We're seeing real progress in terms of our ability to diagnose disease even decades before one develops memory problems. and. All of you have helped contribute to those discoveries. Uh, the, the, the number of medical papers and grants you support is just unbelievable. I'm sorry, I wish I could put your names in those papers, but I pledge to keep you all anonymous. Uh, but I want you to know you have made this possible. Those discoveries are yours. They are yours as much as they're mine, as much as they are anyone else's. And uh, I want you to know you are creating a new world a world where our children and our children's children and all humankind to come are going to be living in a place where Alzheimer's does not exist, where dementia is unheard of, where the golden years remain golden forever. You're the heroes that we celebrate today. Now, we're also working on a few things, and so I had to throw a few plugs in, you know, upcoming educational events. We'll try to uh, get Dr. Jaika in a place where he has technological assistance uh, so that uh, they run smoothly. But uh, uh, we are working with the Louis Body Association, hopefully in the next month or two, uh, to bring you a uh, screening of uh, the Robin Williams uh, documentary called Spark. It's about Robin Williams and his battle with Lewy body dementia, uh, the science behind Lewy body disease, and a real insight through Robin and his wife uh, uh, as to uh, what the disease means. And of course, later this spring, again, we're probably going virtual again, but uh, the Mind Matters uh, Health Fair, we certainly look forward to. So you guys stay posted. Uh, we've got a lot coming up, <coughs> not only research study wise, but a lot coming up to engage you, to challenge your mind, uh, to help you continue to do well. As I always tell everybody, we do not want to study you as you develop a memory problem. Our goal is to keep you from having a memory problem and to try to do our darndest to keep it from getting any worse and hopefully improve your memory and thinking as we move forward in the field with stronger and stronger medicines. So thank you for your dedication and efforts. Again, they are moving us closer to the world that we want to see. We're all in this together. It's the only way we're gonna do this and we're winning. I want you all to know that. So with that, I, I will stop sharing and uh, I think I'd stop sharing and uh, see uh, uh, if there are questions uh, and thoughts. I'm sorry I couldn't get to every single study we're doing, but it would have taken me three, four hours. And uh, 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 and uh, uh, but if any of you have particular questions, uh, uh, thoughts or comments, I I'm happy to uh, address those in, in any way that I can. I also see that Dr. Wilcock has hopped online, who's really been a driving force here at UK, moving those blood biomarkers forward. Uh, we're, we're, we're not 100% there yet. You know, I, there are some studies where we still do need your spinal fluid or your PET scans, but we're getting closer and uh, that's just wonderful. I don't know, Donna, if you wanted to, uh, say something to the group in terms of those discoveries. Yeah. Pete, Linda, and Catherine have already talked. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I was talking to another group at, at 12. So uh, I just want to really thank 
like all of you for everything that you do. Um, you're really driving this forward. I sent Dr. Jaika some data yesterday on the blood uh, that we've been looking at um, uh, from, from you all and it looks really good. And I know everyone would love to not have that needle stuck in their back, but in their arm and, and I want that too. And um, I think uh, over the next few years, we're gonna see this really drive forward. And um, it's, it's thanks to those individuals who have given their spinal fluid and their blood on the same visit that we're able to really look at this and say, you know, we think this works. So thank you to everyone, you, you're all amazing. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Donna. I know that there were a few questions that have been posted online. One was uh, uh, asking about uh, uh, how to find out more information uh, uh, about participating in uh, uh, research studies. And uh, of course, you call us at the center. Uh, the number is 859-323-5550. Uh, Again, that's 859-323-5550. And, and uh, we will help you, Angela and Sally and our other staff will help you uh, get the information that you need to make the choice that's right for you. Uh, Heather with our team has also pointed out that if you hop online, there is a, a link uh, that uh, you can uh, uh, click on and you can insert your interest in research or your questions and somebody will get back to you. So two different ways to do this, either by telephone or uh, uh, online uh, as well. And uh, uh, I don't know if anyone can actually share that link with all the participants. Uh, we do have a, a, somebody who asked about the study years ago that looked at selenium, and uh, that actually is the uh, AT001 and the alpha study that I presented. As uh, so we're seeing some early positive results uh, uh, from that study, and uh, we need to look at the data in greater detail from the phase two that was done. Uh, but uh, we remain optimistic uh, that uh, uh, this may have an impact, uh, as we saw with the animals, a 40% reduction in the development of Alzheimer's plaques and tangles, uh, that uh, uh, something as inexpensive and benign as this selenium supplement, if it could slow the likelihood of getting Alzheimer's again by just five years, uh, we would cut the number of Alzheimer's cases in half, we would save millions and millions of people. Uh, we would save billions and billions of dollars. Uh, this, uh, 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 all of these different medicines have their place and each and every one of them is important. They're really building for us the armament we need to take down these diseases. Uh, to make them a thing of the past. And that's where we're going. And we are not going to stop till we get there. So I don't know. I have the. One point about that, Dr. Jack, just to sort of underscore, I know that this is winding down here, but is that it takes a long time to figure out if something works or doesn't work. It takes a lot of people to be involved. It takes a very, it's a very big process and we don't immediately have the information because sometimes even we don't know who's on placebo and who's on drug, um, or at least we don't directly have access to that. And so the process of working its way through the system takes a long, long time and it needs people to be involved. And so there's a great, great deficit of that around the country this is one of the few places where there's really great, enthusiastic research volunteers, but it's an exception to the rule. So uh, it's something, are you here? Yeah, you're bouncing in and out a little bit, Pete. Or am I glitching now? Sam, so, I think that that's in- uh, uh, Okay, I, forget it. I think you get my point. 
Gotcha. I think that that's very important. You know, some of the points that uh, Dr. Nelson was raising, you know, it is true when you're in a study, we don't know. I have people all the time that tell me, you know, please, or, or, or they'll tell me, please put me in the active drug group. Don't put me in the placebo. I have no control over that. I do not know. I, uh, it is true when somebody's in a study, if there were harmful side effects, I can unblind anyone and get that information. But it means you get thrown out of the study uh, and that, that doesn't really help anybody. Uh, but you should know that I have that option as a safety so that we can make sure uh, to the best of our ability that any experimental medicine you may take, that we are keeping you safe. Your safety always, always comes first. Uh, uh, but uh, again, we also know what the consequences are of doing nothing. And those consequences are not good. So uh, um, uh, again, uh, uh, when I say heroes, I mean, I mean you all. I mean, uh, uh, standing up to understand that there may be some risks, but that we are going to move the field forward. We are going to find those medicines, and uh, most of you, I know, you'd uh, uh, want to. <clears throat> do this for others, uh, and that's the noblest. Uh, it's okay to do it for yourself, but it's very, very noble when you're motivations are really uh, uh, to help everyone else out there. Uh, that's just amazing. I'm forever grateful. You're going to help me find medicines that are going to keep my children from ever having Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I owe you a debt of gratitude for that. So I, I think with that, uh, it has been a long afternoon again my apologies to everybody for the technical difficulties uh, the next time we have a program i'm going to get three laptop computers in front of me to make sure that one of them can uh, uh, find its way onto the system again uh, dr uh, uh, nelson uh, dr van eldick uh, uh, catherine uh, and the others who filibustered for me while i was trying to connect uh, thank you so much for putting you on the spot and for the great job you've done today and and uh, dr j i would just say um it wasn't just you apparently zoom is having a nationwide zoom problem so yeah I don't, I don't, I don't know what happened today. Uh, uh, anyway, I, I, uh, you all stay safe. I, uh, uh, have a fire, snuggle under a blanket. I, uh, read a good book, keep that brain sharp and, uh, we'll see you soon.